Anne with us. So Anne Van Damme is here. Hello, Anne. So we're Hi, missing Anne. you. <laughs> and then thank you for introducing me to Debbie. <laughs> uh, uh, voila, so this is Ali Azzedin for Generation for Education, uh, our special day related to math today. Uh, and this is our fourth session this afternoon. We will be talking about math in the early year. In that chat, remember to put all panelists and attendees. If you have any question to uh, Debbie, feel free to send it in the Q&A. And I'm going to let now Debbie take us through a very inspiring presentation and uh, enjoy the session. Debbie, it's for you. Oh, thank you. I'm just going to get my screen up here. And yes. welcome to, uh, to everyone from all over the place, which is, which is great to see. So thank you, Ali, for, um, for inviting me today. It's, uh, it's a, a real pleasure to be here to talk about uh, mathematical thinking with our youngest, with our youngest children. Um, so just a very brief little bit about me. Um, I'm based in the UK, right in the middle of, the, of, of England, in the middle. Um, I've been, and I'm from a, an arts background. I'm an artist educator. So I've been working in education now for about 25 years. I'm also a lecturer and I'm also very closely related to um, the network of Regio Children through my work as a co-director with Sightlines. And Regio Amelia serves as a sort of a real strong inspiration uh, behind the work that I, that I do. So I've got lots to share with you today about mathematical thinking. And at various times, um, I'm going to ask you to, to pause and reflect and share your thoughts. So I've got some, some um, opportunities for that. So it'd be great to hear back from you. And I know Ali is brilliant at being able to uh, uh, yes. the comments <laughs> and the questions. And, and let me let me remind them to make sure they are choosing in that chat box all panelists and attendees so we can all see your message and read your reflection and i'm keeping an eye on our chat on facebook debbie so come in people on facebook feel free to uh join and interact with us okay that's wonderful all these different sources fantastic so i've got three sort of guiding questions or sort of three main areas that i'm going to be looking at in in this session um the first one is about you know well what is it that we know about math and mathematical mathematical thinking that will help us with our work with young children um, and really to think holistically about how math is encountered and expressed by young children. And then finally, how our early childhood spaces can become places that provokes curiosity and provokes the desire to play with many concepts within maths, uh, number, pattern, measuring, quantity, for example. So, to begin then, mathematics, um, which is what really interests me, mathematics has been described as an art motivated by beauty. Um, and, you know, as an artist educator, I think this is something that really um, provokes and is attuned to my own uh, curiosity. Um, and you can see mathematical um, ideas in arts um, connected with things like patterns, symmetry and tiling, of course, geometry, um, fractals, and of course, Fibonacci numbers and the golden, the golden triangle. Oh, oh you know, when your computer doesn't want to play, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so mathematics really can you know, you can you can uh, see mathematics throughout the arts, and a, you know, a good Google search will will find you. You know, many 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 examples of how it occurs in music, I mean, dance, painting, architecture, sculpture, even textiles. 
Um, and there's just two examples, two examples here um, of, of math uh, being used in dance. And I really recommend actually you look up um, these two, Eric Stern and Carl Schaefer, and they've done a, a TEDx talk, but there's also numerous videos of, of them in how they've sort of dramatized um, and, and uses dance to um, that is connected um, with, with mathematical ideas. Of course, dance is essentially a sequence of music. And also, you know, through the visual, through the visual arts, uh, mathematics um, is, you know, about pattern and I love this uh, this quote in mathematics is the science of pattern and painting is articulation through the pattern so just two brief examples there so in terms of mathematical thinking then um, in in early childhood um, we always you know one of the things we always talk about is yes there is the breadth of understanding but also that sort of deeper or more complex mathematical knowledge um, and building that deep mathematical knowledge involves the things that we can see here so being playful of course in the early years is so important um, and there are many of course manipulations uh, you know that we that we buy in but we'll also be looking at different sorts of you know non-math manipulatives um, that we can that you can use in your in your schools as well um, and of course it's uh, it's about the, the manipulating things but also pictorial and graphic materials too so I'm going to be showing you some examples of, of children's mathematical thinking as it comes through in their in their drawings and also it's about building this greater awareness of the different kind of strategies um, to investigate and solve and solve problems um, and having of course these positive beliefs and attitudes um, that maths isn't something that we feel oh I'm not very good at that or I don't really understand it but something you know that you know maths is you know something really exciting for for young children to be to be to be doing and for us to hold those positive beliefs as well and you can see the other two points there about um, having confidence and persistence um, and also this uh, evolving sense of of skills for communicating and expressing reasoning and that's something i'm going to be coming back to uh, later on so mathematical thinking then uh, is about you know when we look at children young children um you know children have a very much a very strong embodied sensitivity to math and to number um and in, in one of the ways that we could um uh, you know de describe this in embodiment of of, of math is that we f first um encounter uh, and feel math through our bodies and it was a wonder it was a wonderful time for me to spend some time with one-year-olds in in Stockholm in Sweden and they had built a room um, for which their their very youngest children their one-year-olds were were in there and it was a room that they could experiment and feel in the body what heavy and what light felt like and you could see these these young children trying to grab things and pull things and you could see from their whole body that you know understanding what something is to you know that has got a weight you could see that being expressed through through the body and one of the interesting things i found out recently i i i hadn't thought about this before was that if we look at the word arithmetic and we can see through its sort of etymology of, of this word. And um, we can see the root of the word as being number and art. Um, so again, that really connected with me. Um, but also where I've highlighted it in, in red here, it's almost the word rhythm is within that as well. And when you think of, you know, again, in the body and, and rhythm, you've got the rhythm of 
the heart constantly beating um, as another kind of embodiment of mathematical thinking in the body. So we'll just break here then. And, and what I want you to just to share initially is in what ways do you really play around with uh, mathematical thinking with children in your early childhood classrooms, but also in your outdoor spaces. So what are the kind of things that, um, that you want to share with each other um, in terms of you know, playing with mathematical thinking with children? So for all our attendees here on Zoom or on Facebook, this is a question for you. Let's share our thinking. And Lynn uh, is referring to provision of loose part, agency, and time to explore. Mm. Uh, Diksha is mentioning a lot of hands-on activity. Marta is mentioning the construction area. And mm. Natalie is referring to the sand and water play and how it's connected to uh, math. Uh, Hiba is mentioning the measurement concepts. And then we have a little project that we embed about the merchant project. Um, and uh, mentioning exploring possibilities, uh, using natural materials and resources, and then all the blocks and the cubes. Fauzia, Fauzia, mm -hmm. hello. Uh, and again, uh, 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 starting from pattern, looking at the calendar, the construction area, uh, and so on and so on. That chat is on fire. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, looking say. at all, the, or looking at the shapes, the patterns, recycling materials using tangrams, and making real life connections. Absolutely. Those real life connections are so important. And I was just thinking then somebody had mentioned about playing around with measurement and you think, you know, for, for young children, they are living uh, measurements because they are growing all of the time. Um, often they will be measured against doors or, you know, different walls so they can see how much they are, they are sort of growing. So that's another example of sort of math being lived out in, in the body. Um, so a little bit then just about my math story um, and, and, and how I, um, sort of lost the passion really for for maths um, through my educational uh, sort of journey and I suppose I went to school at the age of, of four in September so I didn't turn five until the end of that school year in July and I was a very happy and confident child um, and but you know, I was very happy, very confident, but by the age of seven, by six, seven, um, I already considered myself as being not good at maths. Um, and, you know, when we looked at that slide earlier, having that sort of confidence in your own maths ability is something that is just so incredibly important for children to feel. So the first thing that went wrong for me was that I didn't feel I didn't have that po that positive attitude, um, and that was probably due to teaching at the time where everything would be marked with a red pen across across the the sums that I was doing in a book. We didn't have much time. I can't remember actually spending a lot of time um, using using math manipulatives, for example. And actually the counting on fingers was something that was banned um, in, in my schooling. And so when I, anything was sort of taught, whether it was uh, sort of multiplica multiplication um, or, or division sort of methods, it was very much you were taught a very singular method, one way of, of being able to do that, um, which was very restrictive. And when you look at maths mastery, as a concept, we want to be able to be finding those answers in as many ways as possible. And so I developed this sort of poor uh, mathematical identity over, over time. And possibly um, because I didn't have any sort of hooks 
for mental calculation. And I don't know, because I find it very difficult actually to be able to find patterns in numbers. Um, uh, mental calculation is very difficult uh, for me. Um, and as an adult, I probably realize that I am dis I've got dyscalculia. But actually, I don't know, because it could actually just be um, the results of bad teaching. Um, so, so you can, you know, our importance as educators to build rich mathematical identities with children is really, really important. And I can remember, for example, being in a, in a high school maths lesson, which was about mental calculation and thinking, um, you know, if I write down the answer, one answer, I will probably miss the next five in working it out, but at least I'll get a fifth of the, the answers marked. So it was still maths, but uh, not quite in the, in the way that the, uh, the teacher was, was, was thinking that it, that it should go. Um, but, you know, so with that, the, our responsibilities then with children is really great. Um, and Alan Bishop, who you know, writes considerably about uh, maths and, and how really we can work with children with maths, how can we create cultures of mathematical thinkers who are thinking about mathematical ideas. And he identifies these six key areas which we need to consider. So these aren't necessarily maths concepts, but um, activities that will help develop uh, knowledge about those concepts. So counting, of course, um, I don't need to explain that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Even I can count. <laughs> uh, locating, you know, in terms of navigating and orientating yourself. Uh, there, there's some very bad in it, Debbie. <laughs> Pardon? I'm very bad in the locating one because <laughs> I think in again, if I if I connect to my childhood, it was not a concept that we used a lot in our primary education. And then when I moved to other countries, maybe because in Lebanon, whenever you are lost, you just go and ask the person. Uh, so now we are happy that we have a Google map. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, some of these things can then de skill us again yeah. in, in terms of some of these. So being able to, to locate, and I would I would echo Ali that I I you know sometimes when I'm driving, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm going around we would say going around the reeking here, but going around, um, you know, in familiar routes that I know, rather than thinking, you know, what's the most direct route there. Um, but so we've got measuring there, designing, um, which is about really about um, geometry and shapes, um, and, and of course, playing. And, and in the early years, we grasp playing, you know, we get playing, but playing with number, playing with shape, um, you know, is something that we need to take into, you know, our entire, into our entire lives. And the most difficult one is explaining, being able to explain, being able to reason um, the, and to articulate, communicate, express how and why you are coming to the answers that you are, that you are giving. So this, so this then, this um, explaining, um, and Douglas, uh, I don't know if you, there's a fabulous author, Douglas Adams, and he wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, and it was a book that I loved as a, as a teenager, particularly. And his main character throughout this book, he was searching for the ultimate question of life. Uh, a very, very important mission. So the book details this journey to find the ultimate answer to life. And right at the end, if you're going to read this book, close your ears now. Um, this is a spoiler alert. And right at the end, he finds out what that answer is. And the answer is 42. And then from the next books that follow on from that, because he was like, 42, 42, what does that mean? 
And so he spent the next set of, you know, set of books um, trying to find what the question was. And for me, this illustrates how the how the answer is just a part of that equation. Um, just as knowing what the answer, you know, to a problem is of a question without the reasoning of why, it's only half of that game of mathematics. And even for our youngest children, looking at how they are explaining and giving reasoning to things, finding the words to describe different mathematical concepts is something that we can, on the whole in the early years, be something that we, we need to focus in on a little bit more. So this, you know, is something that you know a student a student teacher knows to do this and that this is like a really significant goal for us um, and to understand that to express you know explain it to express is about communicating and communicating is of course a very strong cognitive cognitive skill just underlined here by by demos is saying communicative processes are cognitive processes these processes and vice versa. So here is a here is a challenge that um, was set in a recent webinar uh, by Reggio Children um, that was about children and numbers, and they said here that it's it's not good enough always for children to play mathematical games or with provocations of materials alone in the environment we as educators must support their language, their conversation and the linguistics of their mathematical thinking, their reasoning and calculation. Um, and this really made me sort of stop and pause and reflect actually um, about some of the things that, for example, that I've done in the past because they're saying mm, it's not enough actually for just for children just to be playing with with materials and they gave examples um, of how you can sensitively uh, build language together with children um, to describe the the processes that are happening through and with their play um, here's a, a little example of of that that from some work um, in a, in a school in the UK. Um, and this, this came up really um, a bit like a bit like cap and chance so that we can see that there is some uh, loose parts here. And already you can see on those sort of silver trays, you've got ideas of sequencing, you know, these children have sort of borrowed ideas caught like a, a, a virus, this sort of contagiousness of ideas of using, you know, the green and the white, the green and the white sequence things. Um, and they had also got this mirrored card in this space as well. And one of the children had said, well, look, you know, there was one that side and one on this side. When I shined the mirror on it, there was one pattern in there and another one in there. They look alike. So this is an example of, you know, in this moment, these children could have been just left to their own devices. Um, but it took sort of the uh, uh, an educator's question you know, to ask questions such as, you know, what do you notice about your composition in the mirror? And, you know, we don't have to wait for particular answers. Um, you know, we can provoke and ask uh, pertinent, but also sensitive uh, questions in the moment with children that can help them think about the reasoning behind what they were doing. And of course, ideas about symmetry are being explored here. And another, another little example here, um, this, this uh, four-year-old uh, boy here, he had been he was in an area where there were lots of different types of, of weighing scales. So the kind you find in bathrooms, balance scales like this, all sorts of different types 
of weighing scales. And in a nearby and in an adjacent area, um, there were these uh, magnetic shapes. And he had brought that resource into, into this area. And he was fascinated um, because, because of how the, it was, those uh, magnetic shapes were attracted to the metal of those scales. And there was clearly a very pleasurable uh, reaction to how the magnet shapes were attracted in this way. And the educator working, uh, you know, in this area had noticed this. And he had said that, you know, this is really heavy. And he used the word, they have magneted to the metal, which is a lovely sort of creative, in, inventive word to describe the effect of attraction of these sort of, mag and the, of magnetic forces. But a great question was asked here in terms of, well, how do you know it is heavy? And as a four-year-old, he said, you know, well, this side is heavy for me to lift and this side is not quite heavy. So you can see in what he said here, he has an understanding of heavy, but he hasn't quite got the word for the opposite. You know, he hasn't, he hasn't got the word for light, but he's trying to find that, that word. Now, this is an opportunity, of course, to share that word, you know, what I would call quite heavy light and being able to develop and build that vocabulary together. Um, but the, the, what, what this educator did do was to ask, how can you show people how heavy it is? And he grabbed a, a, a clipboard nearby and drew this on a piece of paper. And you get the sense in this drawing of these masses of these shapes at the top with sort of a force that is going downwards here. So this is an example of reasoning both with both with spoken words, um, but also um, going into a graphic language there as well. So we're getting we're getting a lot of feedback on the example. Uh, so let me let me share with you, Debbie, what we have got before we start another chat. Uh, so. Uh, the participant made some connection to the visible thinking and how visible thinking routines help in uh, expressing the understanding. Uh, and uh, she mentioned that the image is amazing because it's showing us the language of drawing and the importance of drawing. So it's not only uh, about talking like, and, and we've done uh, this session uh, uh, last time in October and when we had a, a webinar with Debbie about the importance of drawing and how drawing can express concepts. And then Lynn, she mentioned, we're seeing co-constructing of knowledge and understanding. And so Pushpa, she just added very beautiful examples. Oh. So what is our new chat about? So what well, in sharing our sort of common wisdoms between us, um, this is what I love about opportunities like this, is that we can all come together and just share you know, what, what, what we know and what we understand and what we do. So just think about, you know, what are the ways that, that you have, that you can remember in how you've supported children in developing their, their language of mathematics. I'm, I am speaking here more of the verbal language of mathematics. Of course, that is just one way, but their verbal language of mathematics and how that language uh, enables them sort of the powers of reasoning so what do people think about this question? <laughs> so Anne, uh, she, uh, she says, what makes you say that? Uh, we use our uh, math vocabulary. We put these keywords in our languages. Again, from Anne, can you explain your thinking to me? Uh, we read stories uh, from Facebook. We are making space in our classroom. Uh, by giving them opportunity to explore and share. Uh, Anum, she said, can you support your answer or explain your answer? Uh, allow them to express their thoughts toward their works, encourage them to speak uh, using keywords in our world problems. Uh, by uh, talking about the concept yourself, you are a modeler, you're, you're modeling it. Uh, Lynn, uh, she said, uh, I see that you have, instead of seeing, I see that you have, can you tell me about this? 
So ask a question instead of making assumption, uh, justify or explain. And these are some of the ideas that I collected for you from the chat and from Facebook, Debbie. That's great. Thank you, Ale. So you uh, let me say hello to Ola. I'm so happy to see familiar faces. And then Ola, she just mentioned, can this be done differently? Yeah. And uh, absolutely, because that, that differently links to that, you know, there are many ways of doing these things. And I think the greatest gift that we can give children is time time to explore but also time to to find the the uh you know time to revisit and repeat things so that they can notice the patterns in things themselves and giving time to explain their thinking um as well so you know we can ask a question but you know having that time for them to answer is just so important um as well and asking the, the question at the right time of course so let's just go back to maths and the body just for a, a quick moment and back to this picture in particular which is a a great a great great image because you can see this child here um, and you can see some of the things that she is already encountering with her body you know one two three four five up to ten up to twenty we've got pairs and doubles we've got fingers as a counting method and fingers and toes being things constituting things to be able to count here um, so you know this, you know, again, it's not about maths as being abstract for children. We, it has to be, um, as, as, as Jennifer Tom says here, it has to be concrete and has to be embodied um, as well with young children. And of course, this sense of embodied maths is not, of course, it's not something new. When I mean, we only have to look back, you know, there's just some examples here, um, you know, in how maths is, you know, embodied um, in our human history, you know, with the Egyptian cubit and palm, um, you know, this is the one of the first rulers, um, and, and also in how, you know, using our feet as sort of, of, of measurements as well. Um, and, you know, the yard and, and six feet, you know, sort of measurements in feet. Um, it's certainly something that here in the UK, um, we still use, especially when buying fabric. We know, you know, it's more likely we would buy a yard of fabric yes. uh, than, yeah, same, um, than, than sort of a, than a meter. I'm old fashioned, so I like yards in, uh, in fabrics when, I, when I'm buying them. So, you know, when we think about bodies and young children and how math is encountered and, and those ways that we can sort of find not the sort of the, the daily counter, daily encounters that, that children are doing and how we can possibly use these as sort of relaunches back with the children. That the idea of a relaunch is very much a, an idea originating from, from Reggio Emilia in how they will observe something really closely, a group of children perhaps, and then analyzing that closely to find a, a, a possible way, a relaunch back to them. So for example, here we've got some jumping and there's many sorts, you know, in, in the maths of jumping, jumping up, down, across, jumping high, jumping low, finding out who can jump the longest. Um, it's a wonderful research project for two-year-olds. You see two-year-olds who are just, you know, or just a little bit younger than two-year-olds who are trying to figure out how they jump. And they do that thing first, don't they? I can't show you on here, but they sort of try and jump, but their feet don't leave the ground, but they know that they can. So at those times, those are a kind of like explosive uh, sort of times. Um, and one, a little project that they did in, in Reggio with their two-year-olds was all about jumping um, and, and setting up opportunities to jump because it was a way of, uh, you know, and I say opportunities to jump, it was things like having masking tape along the floor that sort of you encounter as a young child and, and want to jump on or want to jump over, sort of embodying these concepts 
um, of, of length and distance and height um, in, a, in a physical way. And of course, stairs. <laughs> you know, I have a video of my daughter on the stairs and every time we watch it, we start laughing, both of us, because she's going down, going up, and then it's, it's really, uh, that's how it starts. I'm loving the idea, Debbie, how you are connecting math in the earliest to the body and to the human body. Yeah, it's 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 fundamental, isn't it? And like like say in your video, you know, the, it's such a joy. Children, you know, will figure it out. But look at you know, it's not just the counting of the steps, but it's that exploration of the depth of things, the width of things, the height in terms of how high it goes. Lots and lots and lots of opportunities where children are encountering maths in their daily experiences. Um, and this is a little example from a, from the schools I work I've worked closely with for a number of years in in Stockholm, and here this is in their local environment. Um, it's a it's a, a spiral as you can say a spiral of stones. So here children are balancing themselves walking along these stones. You can see they've actually got little they're what they're wearing. Uh, they've got their uh, ice suits on, but of course on their backs they've got um, snail shells that have been made as part of a project uh, looking at how uh, young children can look after snails. So here, you know, they are encountering the math of spiral here, but it's connected with meaning making because it's connected to them and their pet snail that they have got at school. There's a whole beautiful little project that sits behind this, which is wonderful. Um, uh, but we're thinking about maths today. But here also is another example of, uh, this is a maths room um, for, for the youngest children here. So you can see the types of, of very simple made resources here, but all brought together into one space for these, for these very tiny toddlers to encounter, to feel the differences in weight and capacity um, of pulling things um, that are heavy and pulling things that might be big, but are also uh, very light. So of course we know about mathematics and nature, and this is a place where children will encounter mathematics as well. Um, I'm always fascinated by sunflowers um, and, you know, the patterns that are within them, you know, that, that Fibonacci sort of pattern that is in there. And also, you know, in a way it's, um, you know, this is nature's way of making sure that the maximum amount of seeds are, are inside that flower head. But it's a mathematical concept that is in there, as too is this angel fish um, whose stripes, you know, maths has, has helped us to see how the stripes on the angel fish actually move across they migrate across the, mod, the the body of this fish over over time um, and so you know just as music is auditory patterns that the human mind uh, finds really pleasant um, and Keith Devlin sort of a Stanford um, mathematician who says that mathematics captures patterns that the universe find pleasant and if you like patterns and if you like sorry let me start that again I can't read my own writing here <laughs> mathematics mathematics captures patterns that the universe finds pleasant if you like patterns that are implicit in the way the universe works so not only are we embodied with mass but it surrounds us absolutely everywhere we can't escape from it and neither can the children it's like nature gives us things to count whether it's stamens it gives us things to consider in terms of the size of leaves um the daily encounters we might be working you know sharing food uh, fruit with one another and the and the segments that are inside the pattern and the math the counting all there so really the question that we have to ask ourselves all of the time is 
where is the math in this? You know, everything has the possibility for maths. Um, so that's a question that I'd like you to sort of hold in mind when you go back to your to your your spaces and places um, and have a look around and not just concentrate on the thing on the thing you know the block area the manipulatives that you know are you know specifically for us but look in those other areas look in your gardens look in the natural spaces and 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 find out where is the math in the most unexpected places that you can find We've done this exercise in the previous session when we were talking about math across the curriculum. And it's so nice to hear this again, even for our early years educators. Absolutely. It's no different. Um, and so here are some little examples, you know, children at work with clay. It wasn't a, a, a maths time. But just by breaking off the clay, the children begin to count. There were some matchsticks on the table. And you can see this sort of one-to-one -one correspondence that is being done there. Um, you know, other examples of that, you know, collecting, finding things, um, which is a human characteristic. We like to collect, gather, and, and bring things together. Um, you know, they invite always the, the idea of playing playing with number in practical ways. I adore this photograph. Um, it's one uh, from Reggio Emilia and the laying of the table for lunch is a huge thing um, in their schools. Um, so each morning, two children, um, they become the ones who are going to be taking care of lunchtime. Um, their first job is to find out how many children are there. Uh, form a tally, take that to the school cook, um, who then knows how many plates worth of food to do. Then they need to prepare the trolley that will that they will take to then go and lay the tables for all the children. So they have to figure out how many plates, how many bowls, how many pairs of cutlery do they need to put on the table? How many tablecloths? In which way are they going to decorate the table so that when the children come, they find something beautiful? And you can see here, even in the arrangement of flowers here, there's, there's uh, you know, that the, the careful placement and composition of things and the sequencing of things are things that we can see here. Um, and then even when they are eating the food, of course, I've got to count the, 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 you know, how many chairs do they need as well. But even when you are eating the food together, that embodiment of, you know, full and empty, do I, have I eaten too much? Have I eaten too little? Do I feel full? Do I feel empty? Maths, we cannot escape. So another opportunity here, what other situations um, that, are, that are involved in those sort of daily encounters? Can you imagine and find in math within? So we are getting uh, the cooking concept. And uh, again, yes, keeping an eye on, on time. We still have around 15 minutes. This is an opportunity for everyone. If they have any question to send it in the Q&A and I will continue reading the chat. Uh, so birthday celebration, uh, getting test, going to the shopping, making lists. All these are situation where we can find a uh, math and we can explore math, buying stuff. Uh, pattern in music, making phone calls, uh, 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 using money, uh, and I had a nice connection from Ola mentioning that we are seeing now math everywhere, especially because we have the virtual learning and we are looking at everything from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so the snack time, the uh, playing game, um, the weather pattern, the shapes around us, the lining up, reading the calendar. So all these are opportunities and oh, giving, uh, checking, checking on, on Facebook. So our daily routine in the class and the patterns on the clothes, all these are ideas shared by our attendees. So, so many. Um, I, I'm also thinking, you know, in these times of social distancing here, uh, you know, that, that, that children have a real strong sense, you know, particularly here in the UK where it's like a two meter 
two meter rule. They have this sense much earlier of what two meters kind of looks like and, and feels like as well. And I think all these, you know, when we're transitioning places as well, where we might have to take off our shoes, for example, you know, there are opportunities to think about, think about pairs or different ways we could line up and arrange those shoes, for example. So instead of just like rushing through and saying, come on, you know, get your shoes off, you know, we're going to do PE or whatever it is that you're doing, you know, you could find those extra five minutes there just to make different arrangements. How shall we put our shoes today? Shall we put it in a triangle? Shall we do them in pairs? Shall we do them, you know, in different kinds of, of ways? So I want to return then to sort of children's graphical um, explorations. And I can't recommend these authors enough because they have looked at um, how through children children's own drawings, uh, mathematical thinking is expressed. And, and what it means for the educator is that we have to know very clearly in our own heads, you know, have a kind of taxonomy of understanding of the potential things that might arise in drawing. So these are two great books. Um, and you can see here, this, this little boy here, Alex, and Alex is actually very cross. And we can see he's, he's also making lots of cross shapes on the ground, which could be plus signs, which could be multiplication symbols. Um, we, do, we don't know. But he's really cross because children who are playing another game, they're playing cars and garages and, and filling up uh, cars, um, they keep driving them in the space where he's trying to do something. He's very cross about this. He tells them, please stop, don't come here. Doesn't work. He <laughs> goes away, he finds some chalk, he comes back and he starts furiously making these marks on the floor and this verbal thing of saying no doesn't work and for him you know this cross is is sort of a, a signifier uh, it's a symbol it says do not come here and it was a visual symbol that was read by the other children so now with this visual cue the other children are going okay we, we stay away from this area and and in this way what he's doing is marking space he's dividing space he's creating a boundary um, and making a space of his own in a very simple way that could could be missed if we don't have that sort of mathematical eye to things. Here's another example. Um, uh, so these two children have been playing a kind of game of basketball and the teacher has suggested that maybe they might like to get some chalk um, to represent, um, she doesn't give them a strategy, but says that they might like the chalk to record the scores. And this is what he did. So Henry here with the, with the pinky colored chalk, um, he draws a cross and he says, a cross means you win and a straight line means you lose. A circle means you have six goals. And the boys played this game for over an hour. Um, in the, ex in the ex uh, other example, a different kind of cross, but with, with more lines on it. Um, and this was a double lose. So whatever a double, a double lose is, but it's, it's worse. It's twice as bad as lose. <laughs> that mathematical thought in the mark, but also in that reasoning and description of that mark too. And here's two drawings that were sort of done at a, a similar a similar time, and it involves the humour that children have as well. So here on the left, two friends draw, both drawing their dads, and the one friend says, um, "You know, oh, I've drawn um, I've drawn my dad. He's got lots of eyes. So you can see the two black eyes, and there's lots of pink circles. I've drawn lots of eyes." The other child, she finds this hilarious. So now she's drawing her dad, but she says, I've drawn my dad and he's got five eyes. 
so two very similar drawings, one representing quantities that are not counted, they've just said lots, and the second drawing showing uh, quantities that are being counted in this. Um, and as children are sort of beginning to make marks, finding symbols for things, we begin to see their early written numerals. And this is another great example of, of Alex again, who is trying to, to form these, these, these letters. And he's done this and, and teacher has, he's told, he's, he said to the teacher, right, these are my numbers. And she scribed the numbers underneath. And it's interesting when you analyze this, if you look at number three, it doesn't look like a conventional number three, but it's kind of got the sort of the bumps. If you, you know, if it was turned around around the other side, it's the bumps of this number three, but there's also three humps within that as well. Um, number five as well, um, doesn't look like number five, but the same type of symbol has been used for, for each one. They're sort of very similar. They are, they are the same. So, and six and seven are sort of um, a sequence of, you know, the same kind of line, but then turned around. So we can begin to see that, that again, that sort of math, that thinking here about these early written numerals that, that exist here. And so when thinking about the mathematical graphics in this particular way, um, you know, that they, you know, processes of mathematical thinking are not uh, in a silo, they are connected to creativity, creative thinking, they're linked to reasoning meanings as we, you know, meanings as in meaning making as well, you know, finding the meaning of things, understanding problem solving, I would also say, uh, finding problems to solve as well, as well as sort of negotiation, the negotiation of ideas. So the final thing that I just want to, to touch on um, is how really in our early childhood spaces, we can think of them as places that sort of, you know, are they provoking curiosity and desire to play with? And I've just put some you know, concepts here, but it could be, you know, you look at your, your you know, what you are, your, your, what you are working with and think about how that is represented in your, in your area. So for example, is it a place that provokes curiosity for playing with ideas of weight or about length and height or about talking about more or less? Is that present in your environment? And so just some very quick, quick visuals just to conclude here. You know, children here, again, playing with composition of shape, looking for connections there. Um, also in the outdoors, they're using furniture here in what could be seen as quite a, what are you doing children with all of the chairs? But this is as much about balance and unbalance as they are trying to build things here. Uh, symmetry, of course, with just these beautiful paper shapes that have been cut by the adults, of course, but for playing and with different types of axes of symmetry here. Of course, Reggio Emilia and these beautiful spaces that they have with loose parts. Loose parts is a very, um, I can't you know, I, I think loose parts are beautiful, but we have to think about the intentionality of the choosing and the curating of the materials that we use. And you can see here how these, um, these materials, you know, are, are sort of embodied with ideas of repetition, of heavy, um, of small, um, that can be uh, used and, many, and, and sort of create these compositions in many different kinds of ways. Um, here's a similar thing with just different source, different types of material. So just to, I just wanted to end with this one example. So this is Lottie Boo and she, um, a snail comes into school um, every Friday from one of the children's homes. It's a huge snail and it create, created so much excitement. And here she is. It's, it's her making sense of the snail, her enjoyment with because she loved this snail, but you can see this development of how she's trying to perfect the spiral of the snail here. 
And then the unexpected potential for a snail spiral here happening across the room um, with somebody else, a very young child who finds the potential of a spiral in the banana that she's eating. She connects it with the snail and then brings it to gift to the snail itself as a kind of sort of presence. So I'm going to end there on those two sort of lovely examples for me of how mathematics, um, you know, is also connected with how children are making sense of the world around them. So I'm just imagining our attendees looking at the screen and they were like that uh, <laughs> while you were showing all these photos. Uh, so it's a moment now for some Q&A. Uh, Debbie, if you don't mind stopping sharing your screen yes. now, I would like to remind our participant that we still have a one session this afternoon. And then if you go on our website, I will share with you again the link. Uh, we had a special day about math today. And so all the session will be available on our YouTube channel starting from tomorrow, except the morning session. Uh, next Saturday, we have a very specific day and it will be about positive discipline. And we have a session for you early years educator talking about positive discipline in the early years. And then you can explore our other events on the website. Our thematic days, they have a certificate. It's a paid certificate. Uh, so feel free to go again on the website, buy the certificate. And this is how you can support us in bringing other speakers and creating other uh, thematic day for 2021. We are seeing that you are really enjoying them and you're attending the whole day. I hope many of you will watch also the last session in approximately uh, two hours from now, and we will be talking about creativity and how to bring creativity in math. So any question for Debbie? We, before we wrap it up, I can see all the thank you, Debbie, in that chat. A lovely session. It was very inspiring. And then if you have any question, please send it in the Q&A. And I'm sharing with you all our links for the YouTube channel for the certificates and how to order the certificate. And then if you didn't register for the last session for the day, feel free to do it now. Uh, Debbie, it's always a pleasure working with you. I think uh, people are very happy, fabulous session, amazing. Thank you. Uh, webinars are very inspiring, Debbie. So we're so happy to hear that. Uh, we will give them now a break and then we will be seeing them for creativity in math at 6 p.m. Dubai time. Do your calculation. It's the math day. I'm not going to do the time zone now. <laughs> and uh, Debbie and everyone on Facebook, thank you. And we stay connected. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye. And bye-bye to everybody.